right, so today we're going to talk about glaucoma. You cannot talk about glaucoma without beginning with the basic anatomy of the trabecular mantle itself. We're going to go the other way now because we don't want to ask a new person any questions. So, Chris, yeah. so tell me a little bit about the trabecular mantle. Now, we divide it into areas when we talk about different parts of it. So, you have the uh, ciliary body, you have the the um, iron curtain descending on the nose. All right, so when we talk about the ciliary body, there's a couple different ways you can describe it. You could describe it by what we see anatomically when we look in with a gonioscope mirror. And so, gonioscope is that mirror thing that you put on the patient's eye and you try to fill that in, and then you could see the mesh work, except you can't. It's not like the textbook. When you start doing gonioscopy, all you see is you see about three faint lines, and you go, shoot, is that what I'm supposed to see? Is it open? Is it closed? You've got to do about 200 gonioscopies before you can figure out what you're looking at. But when you're looking in with the gonioscope, the first thing that you see uh, that denotes the anterior most point of the trabecular mesh work is Schwabi's line. What is Schwabi's line? Schwabi's line is where the cornea is inserting into the sclera. More specific. Um, what the, part of the, the cornea? So the uh, decimase membrane? Decimase membrane, exactly. So where decimase membrane ends and the trabecular mesh begins, that's Schwabi's line. So if you're looking with your gonium there, that denotes the anterior most edge of the trabecular mesh. And then as you look in, you see this area here. What is that one usually called? When you look in with your gonium there. Is that the. Um, Is that the trabecular mesh work itself? Well, how do we subdivide the trabecular mesh work when we look at the gonium here? Uh, pigmented portion. That's all right. There's the pigmented portion down here, or the pigmented portion up here? Down farther. Exactly. So, what do we call this more anterior part? Non pigmented portion. Non pigmented, exactly. So, when you see a line that's more than non pigmented trabecular mesh work, then you see a darker line that's the pigmented trabecular mesh work. Uh, Shrub, what do we see underneath the pigment of your bedroom actually? We see uh, Schwalbe's line. Oh, that was up here. Oh, sorry, Schwalbe's line. Uh, the scleral spur. Scleral spur, exactly. So here's the scleral spur, the piece of scleral sticking out. And then finally, what's the last thing that you see? Even below the scleral spur? Ciliary body. Ciliary body or iris root. You can start seeing them. So if you think of the trabecular mesh, the trabecular mesh looks a triangle. Its apex is right where Schwabi's line is, and then its base is denoted by the scleral spur. And the scleral spur is a piece of sclera that comes in and sticks out, and so it actually acts as a shelf where the trabecular mesh work lives. And so it goes around 360 degrees, and it helps support the trabecular mesh work right here. Now, Lee, what is this structure right here? Schwab's canal. What does Schwab's canal do? Basically, it's the uh, conduit for um, for aqueous humor into the uh, venous system. Exactly. So Schwab's canal. If you look at it, it's this kind of oval-shaped canal. It goes around 360 degrees again, like a tube. And so <coughs> the trabecular mesh work, um, the aqueous goes through the bars of the trabecular mesh work. And then into Shum's canal, and then eventually out these aqueous veins, and then draining out of the eye. So if we look at a close-up right here, uh, other Chris, if we look at a close-up right here, what is this area right here called? That is the uh, juxtacanalicular. The juxtacanalicular cells or area. So why is that important? Because uh, that's the area of most resistance. And exactly. So this is where you get resistance to aqueous flow. And so when aqueous flows in here, it's not just an open mesh work. It's not like an open sponge, you know, where fluid goes through. <coughs> you actually do have some cells lining Schlem's canal, this juxtacanalicular area. Those, although they don't have tight junctions, they do have some junctions. So there is some 
active transport in addition to passive transport of aqueous through these juxtacanalicular cells. And so when we look at it, we think this is really where the site of open angle glaucoma occurs. Something is going on right here. Now, when you look at the specular meshwork, you really can't tell the difference between a glaucomatous meshwork and a non glaucomatous meshwork that's aged controlled. So, meaning meshworks look different in 20 year olds than they do in 90 year olds, but take a 90 year old with glaucoma and a 90 year old without open glaucoma, they actually look pretty much the same. And here's a close up of that juxtacanalicular tissue right there. All right, what am I showing right here, Kara? So, it looks like um, there's cornea on the top. <coughs> okay, there's cornea, iris, meshwork. The angle. Um, it looks like it is like closed off by adhesions or scars or something. Maybe. Actually, it's, it's still open. It's a little narrow because there's an IOL sitting here in the cellar sulcus, which I was going to pick you on, but that's okay. Okay. So I'm pushing forward, but this, this angle is still open. Why am I showing this picture? What has been interesting about this? So how does aqueous get out of the eye? It goes through the trabecular meshwork, it goes in the Schlumps canal, and it eventually goes through these veins and then out onto the surface of the epicellar. And so you've got these aqueous veins, and so your mission when you look at people with a slip amp today is find aqueous veins. And what you do is you put your slip beam just back from the limbus, focus through the carnage onto the epicellar, and you'll see They'll look like veins, but then if you look real carefully, you'll see some little box carving of the, of the blood vessels. And there'll be little squirts of aqueous coming in between, so you'll see some box carving when they move in. You never even think about these, and, and until I give this lecture, I don't even think about this. But if you look this afternoon, you'll be able to find it. It's not hard to find, but that's how the aqueous drains out of the eyes, the aqueous veins. All right, again, this just shows you an open angle glaucoma angle. It doesn't look any different than an angle from um, someone else who's in age match control. All right, so when we look at open angle glaucoma, there are primary open angle glaucoma, which doesn't show anything exciting on path, and then there are secondary open angle glaucomas. Now, Reese, what am I showing right here? Uh, Mid-purple translation. What is that usually associated with? Uh, pigment dispersion. So pigment dispersion syndrome. So at one time, there was an argument not that long ago that said, you know, how how does pigment dispersion happen? What's going on? And you know, people look at this, and, and it's one of those things where you look at this, you say, well, it's pretty obvious. Look, those are linear scraping off of pigment posteriorly. And what lines up with the posterior iris in that area to cause this scraping? Uh, zonules. Exactly. So zonular bundles. So if you look at zonules coming off the crystalline lens and attaching here on the ciliary body, where these zonular bundles are, think of a bunch of guitar strings in that area. And if the iris is bowing posteriorly, it'll scrape on the iris. And so it will release pigment from the posterior iris, which then floats into the anterior chamber and clogs the meshwork. So what setting do you usually see pigmentary dispersion in? Uh, it's hyperopic. Actually, it's surprising. It's mildly myopic younger people, which is really weird. Not high myopic, mildly myopic, more males than females for some reason. And usually start seeing this popping up. People are like 20, 30 when this pops up. But for some reason, when you do OCT or, or ultrasound on the eye, you'll see that the iris bows backwards, which is weird in these people. And so the way you treat it is you do a peripheral iridectomy Kind of the same when you do when you have a blockage of the pupil, you know, when you have angle closure. But this one, you've got posterior bowing, which you do a peripheral iridectomy, it'll actually come forward a little bit and, and won't release so much pigment. And here's our trabecular meshwork. Here's where that pigment's been scraped off, and sure enough, there's that pigment in the angle. So 
secondary open angle glaucoma due to pigment dispersion. In the setting for that's like someone that just recently exercised and has like blurring of that, vision. That's where they'll get blurring of vision. They'll get this stream of pigment that's loosened up, and especially if they're out and jogging and bouncing around. They'll get this blurred vision and then it goes away in 20 minutes. And it's interesting, it's the released pigment. All right, Chris, this angle looks funny. It's, it's open, but it's something funny's going on. What's going on here? So is that pigment in the specular meshwork? Well, there's some pigment here. What else is going on here? It looks like melanocytes. <laughs> exactly. So is this um, uh, a melanoma that has metastasized or thrown off melanocytes into the angle? Well, it's a melanoma that has invaded the angle. And so you can get melanomas of the ciliary body, which then secondarily invade the angle. Look at the iris. It's clear back here. It's not up here. It's back here. So that angle's been <coughs> pushed back, and it's been um, invaded by melanocytes. You can get secondary open angle glaucoma from tumors invading the angle. And the most common tumor, you know, in an adult is intraocular tumors melanoma. So this is melanoma arising from the ciliary body and invading into the angle, causing glaucoma. All right, Trump, what are we seeing here? It looks like exploitive material on the, on the lens. Okay, so this should look familiar because we just looked at this two weeks ago. And indeed, you see the classic pattern where you've got the little ring in the center, ring in the periphery, and that's from the pupil acting as a windshield wiper, scraping that material off. So this is exfoliation. There's a close-up of that exfoliative material. Again, we just saw these when we talked about the lens. And when we look at it pathologically, what is the classic term used to describe this? Iron filings. Iron filings. So you see now, is this the anterior or the posterior lens capsule? And why? To, to the detriment of my coronary arteries, the posterior <laughs> is thinner. <laughs> you guys are ultrasounding right next to that capsule. I get an aerobic workout right in front of the gym. So, so actually, the anterior capsule is thicker. What else is there that the anterior capsule has that the posterior capsule normally doesn't have? What are these? Vagolytic 
Exactly. So it's called thicolytic. I don't know why they call it lytic because it's not like the lens capsule is lysed, but these are people who have a hypermature cataract where proteins and is actually leaking out of the capsular bag through an intact capsule into the anterior chamber, and this protein itself will clog the mesh work, as will these macrophages, which are stuffed with this protein that's leaked out, clogged it up. So they get a pretty acute glaucoma to it. <coughs> you know, removing that crystalline lens and washing out the anterior chamber is curative. So you get rid of that when you do that. And this just shows, this was just a aspiration. They weren't sure what was going on. So aspirated, we screwed it on the slide, you see a bunch of macrophages stuff with this stuff. Alright, so this is just to kind of remind us of ways the angle can be different. And so when you look in with your gonio, you know, you're going to look, this is a normal angle, this is the angle closed, and this is a recessed angle. So you always want to be careful when you look with the gonio to say, okay, is this an open angle? Is it too open? Is it not open enough? And that's tricky to do, so you've got to get good at doing it. So, what do we see in your other Chris? So, you have an external photograph. Right eye um, is injected with a mid dilated pupil. Um, so, concerning for like an angle closure um, of the right eye. Exactly. So, you see that classic mid dilated pupil. There's this or, I guess, a Horner's on the right left. And yeah, <laughs> right, Tara. <terrible. laughs> but you see how it's injected? It's kind of painful. The pressure in that eye is going to be high. Pupils have been dilated, and what do we see here on the slip panel? So, kind of iris Bombay, so. Exactly. So, Bombay from the. Greek. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> French. So you let me right into it. <laughs> the French were so far behind the Greeks, they didn't even stupid with the Greeks. The French were living in caves when the Greeks were, you know, doing literature. So, uh, but from the French, Bombay, B O M B E. E with the yeah. Exxon. On the E, right. So, a uh, Iris Bombay. It's a forward bowing of the iris. So you look at the slip beam here, and then you look at the beam against the iris, and look at it. You can actually see it curving up and almost touching the periphery. So, when you look at these, with the slip line, you can literally see them bowing up. So, this would be a narrow angle, which your risk is you can go into angle closure glaucoma. And here you can see an angle that you can get a um, secondary narrow angle glaucoma. So primary narrow angle glaucoma, how does that happen? Um, so it's usually due to kind of a shallow AC with um, some kind of bowing for the iris. Yeah, so you could get, you know, like a high hypro is at risk, small eye is at risk, people with a big lens pushing forward is at risk. And what you do there is you get a relative pupillary block, meaning that you start to get the aqueous blocked right at the pupil, and then as it builds up behind the iris, the iris moves forward and eventually blocks off the angle. So how do you treat that? Uh, so that's a PI. Okay, so you do a or or cataract surgery. Allow the aqueous to you know, come around that, that relative pupillary block. But sometimes you can get a secondary angle closure, secondary narrow angle, and uh, Tara, what are we seeing right here? What's different about this picture? Here's the angle back here. So it looks like um, there's maybe been inflammation or some type of scarring to close off the angle. Yeah, so you can get the angle closing off here. What do we call that when the angle closes off like that? PAS. And what does that stand for? Um, peripheral anterior sneak. Exactly. So peripheral anterior synechia, closure of the angle peripherally with scarring, and here you can see a secondary angle closure with the trabecular mesh work back here and the angle stuck to it. And then what is a cause of secondary narrow angle glaucoma? What's a common reason for that to happen? Um. We're seeing it right here. Hmm? Exactly, the efficiency of avascular. Exactly. So neovascular. Exactly. Look at the surface of the iris, and there's all these little tiny blood vessels on the surface, and eventually 
those will grow into the angle and then contract. So you get a secondary angle closure due to neovascularization. What causes neovascularization aside from the vascular deficiency? <laughs> um, so like any type of ischemia, so uh, diabetics can get it or like a central retinal vein. Exactly. So chronic ischemia. So anything that give you ischemia of the eye can give you secondary neovascularization of the iris, which leads to eventual angle closure, secondary angle closure. Here's the iris, and look at those little tiny blood vessels there on the surface. And so neovascularization of the iris can give you a secondary angle closure. Becca, what are we seeing here? This looks like a, you know, T-Rex, ready to chop down or something. <laughs> So what part of the eye are we looking at here? So, uh, run through the angle again. Look closer. First of all, what tissue is this back down here? That looks like the lens. The lens, and this is not the angle, but the opposite part of the iris. is the pupil border. And the way we can tell when we look at the anatomy of the uvea, this is the sphincter muscle. So not the sphincter that just tightened in you right now, but a different sphincter. Okay? But so sphincter is, is the muscle that closes the pupil. So that's how we know where the pupil are border. What's going on here? What's happening here? cells are stuck to the lens and look they came off right here. So what do we call that when the iris of the pupil border is stuck to the lens? Actually posterior synechia. And so yeah so you can get a secondary um, you know angle closure from pupillary block due to synechia but posterior synechia. Synechia closing the edge of the pupil to the iris, and this is, I mean, to the um, lens, and this one has been broken. And so people broke it, died in it, but look at the pigment still stuck on there. So that is a secondary angle closure due to pupillary block. And sometimes you can even get an inflammatory membrane growing all the way across the pupil. So you get what's called a pupillary occlusion. Now, if you get a 360 degree posterior synechiae, that sticks that whole pupil down, they call it pupillary seclusion, you know, S-E-C, seclusion. And this is if it's a membrane all the way across pupillary occlusion. So if any kind of chronic uveitis, chronic inflammation, anything like that, you can get a totally acute pupil. Yes. So I know mean, they probably don't come that often, but with the motionless ring, like from trauma, mm -hmm. the, does that, is that like, it's not nearly as much pigment as on the floor. Right, not nearly as much pigment, but you can't get pigment when you're dilating the pupil. You see this little ring of pigment. It's almost like it's been imprinted on there from a trauma. <coughs> All right, Reese, this is a little bit of a different view. Why is this different than the others? Um, so, so we're looking, oh, the angle's deeper. Now, here's actually was the mesh work. It's starting to scar off right there. There's an aqueous vein. So what is this? Angle recession. Angle recession. And so when you look at it, people will often say recession of the iris, you know, angle recession. But if you look at it, truly that tear occurs even into the face of the ciliary body. So what causes this usually? Trauma. Trauma. So these are the people who come in, they've got a, a big hyphema, and then eventually, after the hyphema clears up, you want to bring them back again, you know, in 30 days, and you want to go any of them because you need to know if someone who's had a blunt trauma has a recessed angle or not. And so, if someone is going to get, you know, a recessed angle, and then they get glaucoma secondary to recessed angle, how long after the trauma does that occur? It's like 17 years. Yeah, exactly. So you got it. This is where you got to put fear of God in these people. These are 19 year olds. You know, 19 year old idiots get hit with paintballs or fists or two dudes or something. And so, <laughs> you really got to imprint on them. And this is where we use the B word. Now, I never say blind to a patient. 
I say policy. She says, oh, she and I say, Lori and she says something like that. But these are the ones you say, you could get glaucoma from this, and it'll occur 10 years from now, and you could go blind. Blind is a is a visceral word. It's a, it's a word that goes right to the amygdala, you know, right to those centers that hopefully will work because you got to put the fear of God in these guys because these guys have to come back yearly for like 10 years to make sure they don't develop glaucoma secondary to this recessed angle. So for the whole cast, it's like tear between the longitudinal and circular muscle. Mm -hmm. So it's actually within the face of the ciliary body, not the eye. Now you can get iris root torn, irritable dialysis, but um, you don't get glaucoma as often with those as you do for these recessed angles. And this just shows you kind of the difference, compare and contrast. Here's normal on the bottom, there's the meshwork, there's the iris, here's the ciliary body, the scleral spur, and here is recessed. Here's the trabecular meshwork, there's the scleral spur. Look, it's actually torn into the face of the ciliary body. And what happens secondarily is for some reason, I don't know why this is, but the meshwork will eventually close off, and it takes years for that to happen. Here you see the meshwork, it just gets almost sclerotic. So here's a, <coughs> a classic trauma. So let's see, Chris, short-term memory from two weeks ago. What is this right here? Is that a, um, <coughs> I'm blanking on the name of it, but it's the leftover cortical material the something rings, uh, some rings ring. Some rings ring, very good. So this patient has had a traumatic rupture of the lens capsule. We've got this some rings ring that tells you that. Look, here's the meshwork up here. Here's the meshwork up here. So it's traumatic angle recession. Look what's happening back here. So if you look at that, you measured that cup to disc ratio, that would not only be 0.99, that would be like more than one because it's actually even excavated. So here you see an end-stage glaucoma from a previous trauma with angle recession. All right, so Shrav, we're looking at, at optic cups. What would you say the cup to disc ratio here is? Probably about 1 to 1. Hard to tell because they're a little myopic. Um, it's a little bit tilted. Sorry, um, 0.95 or? Not quite that bad, but here's the rim right here. So you see the, the large cupping, and from high pressure of whatever reason, the end stage that damages the eye is cupping, loss of nerve fiber layer, and loss of those axons, and then eventually increased cupping. And then, of course, this is now, you know, 0.85 maybe. And a big cupping of the optic nerve. And then this is, you know, one. This nerve is dead from, from untreated glaucoma. So it's a totally cut optic nerve. And when you look right here, this patient had trauma. Look, there's a penetrating wound with a, an adherent leucoma, a white scar there, adhered to the cornea, and again, a summer drain. And there you see the cupping. Now, what's interesting when you look at the cupping is you can actually see an excavation where it actually is shaped like a bean pot. And so if you look right here, here's temporal. Look, there's not even a fiber there. I mean, those fibers are gone. And then nasally, if you look right here, when you look at these with your 90 diopter, you look, you'll actually see a vessel going around the nasal edge of that cup, and then it'll just disappear for a minute. And that's because it goes around the corner and it excavates. You see posterior bowing of the lamina cribrosa. So our whole intent of treating glaucoma is to prevent that from happening. That's our, that's our goal right there. You can see on the close-up here, again, totally excavated optic cup temporal, nasal. Look at the close-up there. I mean, it looks like it's one of those things David would climb on, you know, where you go <laughs> under the ledge and then hang there and then pull yourself up, so, with your like, fingertips. I guess that, but, but yeah. so, all right. There are some other weird glaucomas that you have to just memorize, and, and there are some weird glaucomas. And this is a patient who had a sudden pressure rise, and so they have sudden pressure rise, be it acute angle closure or whatever. But their pressure shot way up, 
in a short period of time. But we'll look at the optic nerve. What do we see in here? Lee, I'm sorry. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, is that high ionization? Well, when you look at this optic, when you look at this optic nerve here, you see these areas here where it almost looks white. Oh, yeah. yeah. The opgliosis. So it's not so much gliosis as that these, oh, these fibers have been damaged here, but it's in a sector of damage. So this is just one you have to memorize. This is Schnabel's cavernous atrophy. And you just have to remember that because they're both putting this on boards. This is damaged focally, secondary to an acute pressure rise. So you get this acute pressure go up, and it'll actually cause focal damage. And what's weird is, you do a mucin stain, and you see mucin in between these fibers in the anterior portion of the optic nerve. So the way I like to think about it is the pressure is so high, it just forces vitreous into that optic nerve head, because that's where the mucin comes from. And so I'm not sure exactly the mechanism, if it leaks in there, is pushed in there. But the way I remember it is the pressure is so high, it just pushes this mucinous stuff into the optic nerve heads. And this is Schnabel's cavernous action. Bizarre thing, but you know that's what they ask on boards. So. Do they still have high pressures by the time they get to? They clinic? may not. Okay. They may not have pressure. Because how would you differentiate this from like a NAION? I mean, I guess you wouldn't have edema. Well, you wouldn't have the um, positive staining for the um, mucins. Okay, but that's like clinically. Difference. But clinically, you could. It'd be very okay. difficult. So clinically, it's very difficult to distinguish. And this is another interesting thing: is when you have an acute pressure rise you can get focal areas of ischemia of those uh, lens epithelial cells and little focal spots. What do we call that, Chris? Oh, um, let me think of the name. I just from, the, from the Deutsch. Yeah, it's... Uh, I'm drawing a blank. It just sounds cool. They're called it's glaucoflecken. Yeah, glaucoflecken. So That's basically, cool. glaucon is like, I don't know, when I think of that, it sounds like glaucoma and flecken are little flecks. And so, Little flex from a cute glaucoma. Oh, you get pressure flecking. What's that? Pressure, you get pressure flecking. Pressure flecking, yeah, same thing. So, focal areas here in the, in the not in the nerve, but in the anterior, um, underneath the anterior lens capsule here. So, these will eventually go away too, but they're sign of acute pressure rise. Glaucoma okay. flecking. All right, so what does glaucoma do to the optic or to the um, retina teres? What part of the retina is affected by glaucoma? Um, the, uh, the outer nerve, the, um, the nerve layer. Why can't I think of it? <laughs> Boy, the spotlight hits, the iron curtain is across the cerebral <laughs> Um The outer, outer fiber. All right, so by next week, we're doing retina next week. You guys are going to know every layer of the retina by heart for next week, or I'll fuse your eyes with this laser. <laughs> so I'll bathe your back a little bit. So what glaucoma does is it's actually inner retina, inner meaning toward the vitreous, and so it affects the ganglion cells and their axons. So the outer layers of the retina are unaffected. It's inner layer that gets, so it's the nerve fiber layer, ganglion cell layers that get damaged by glaucoma. And what you see right here is you see up above here, this is the macula, lots of ganglion cells. This is the macula in a patient with end stage glaucoma. So you should have all these ganglion cells up here. And you look down here, you have part of the end left. So macula is spared to the very end in glaucoma. So you see glaucoma patients. They'll often have this little temporal island or this little central island of vision left, and the periphery eventually goes away. All right, this is just to show you what it looks like. This is a congenital glaucoma. And congenital glaucomas are very weird. When you get the kids asleep and you examine their anesthesia, you look with a kepi lens or a goniometer at the angle, you'll see a fine velvety membrane across the angle. And, and so when People first started describing glaucoma in kids, congenital glaucoma, they called this Barkan's memory. Barkan was just the guy who <coughs> saw it. But 
<coughs> so their theory is, is that the angles got this membrane blocking it off, and you go in there with a special gonium knife and just cut that angle, then it'll drop back and the pressure will go down. Well, it actually kind of will, the pressure will go down, but it's not just that there's an angle, that there's a uh, membrane going across the angle. That meshwork is just not well developed in congenital glaucoma. So even though you get this little membrane going across it, it still isn't normal. So you can't just go there with a knife and cut it. That really is not a long-term solution. And there's a close-up. Even with that meshwork, it's just not normal. And there's these, this abnormal little membranous stuff in front of it. All right, Becca. What the heck is this? I mean, you can describe it. Looks like there's some. I can't even tell if there's an iris that's atrophied. Yeah, so there's an iris atrophy. We've got holes in the iris. What do we call it? This looks like many different pupils. It's from the Greek. Poly means many. Chorea is pupils. So polychoria, many pupils. And so this is a condition where you look at it, the iris is just atrophied. It looks like it's just being pulled over in this direction, there's big moth-eaten holes in it. And so we want to go into an entity that could cause secondary glaucoma. There's an entity called ICE syndrome. What does ICE stand for? Oh, I don't remember. I just looked at it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> ICE. Urocorneal. Urocorneal endothelial syndrome. And so there is a syndrome if you're a, a lumper. ICE has various different entities under it. If you're a splitter, you want to look at each of these individual entities to see what, what causes them. But ICE, you need to remember three kind of basic subsets of, of ICE. Now, first of all, ICE, do you remember, or is it unilateral or bilateral? 50-50 chance. Say it with conviction. Bilateral. Yeah, well, it's like you. Unilateral. Don't guess it, don't say it. Say it with conviction. So it's actually unilateral. It occurs in younger people, 20s, 30s, it starts showing up. All right, so Reese, this is the first and most common variant of ICE syndrome. What is this called? The, the essential iris. It's called essential iris atrophy. So that's the first subset of ICE. And it's got this polychoria, it's got this eccentric pupil and moth-eaten looking iris. This is the second entity, and Chris, what do you think? Now look, there's some moth-eaten iris here, but what's going on here in the cornea? So it looks like there's some opacification, maybe some edema. Exactly. So which of the subentities has edema of the cornea? Edematous eye syndrome? It's called Chandler's. Chandler's syndrome. So Chandler's is the second subset of eyes. Chandler's. It's still got the moth-eaten iris, but you've got corneal edema. And Shrav, this is the third subset. There's little uh, irregularities or growths on the um, iris, like nevi, iris nevi. Okay, so it's iris nevi, and this is where it's Cogan Reese syndrome, they're the guys who described it. But again, iris nevi, so this is the third subset, and you see these little tiny pigmented bumps all on the surface of the iris. Now, what is the unified field theory of what happens to cause all of these leads? Unified field theory of? It's the epithelialization of the endothelial layer. So it just kind of overgrows and kind of just. So the endothelial rise. layer will just grow across the trabecular mesh, will get onto the iris, and with that will come decimase membrane. So some people will call this desmetization. It's decimase membrane. And I had some gorgeous pictures on my corrupted. Stick. I have to figure out what happened to that. God, if I have to reload those, I'm going to be really upset. And then when you look, this is an actual peripheral iridectomy from a patient with the iris nevus syndrome. Here's, here is the abnormal decimus membrane. This is a PAS state. Look, this is the anterior surface of the iris. You should not have a PAS positive membrane on the anterior surface of the iris. So that's decimus membrane on the anterior iris, and here's the close-up, there's one of those little nevi popping through. So you've got this velvety PAS positive membrane on the anterior surface of the iris, you've got these nevi popping through, so iris nevus. So you want to remember, essential iris atrophy, 
big moth-eaten pupils. Chandler's is that plus corneal edema, and then Irish nevus or folk and grease is where you've got the Irish nevus. They're all characterized by this metization endothelial growth of the anterior chamber. So that's the ice syndrome. There's a close-up of one of those nice little leaf on it. Okay, other Chris. There is a second mass of things you have to memorize for possible secondary glaucoma. And this is the first of those. What the heck are we seeing here? What layer is this, first of all? So that's uh, decimase. Uh, what are we seeing here? So it's kind of a... Additional, I mean, it's posterior embryo toxin. I exactly, so it's called posterior embryo toxin, and it is a thickening of Schwabi's line, even moved more to the center. And so, what is this whole group called? Axenfeld Rieger. Exactly. And so, when you look at these, these were called the anterior segment dysgenesis syndrome or anterior chamber cleavage syndrome. And this is incorrect because the anterior chamber doesn't form by a cleavage of mesoderm. It's actually waves of neural crest that form it. So this was called wrongly, you know, 40 years ago now. But they call this the anterior chamber cleavage syndrome. So you may see that. That still, still sticks. But George Wary, gosh, in the mid-70s, put together a really nice, what he called the stepladder classification of these entities in this that go from kind of step A to step Z, step E. But the first thing you see is the so-called posterior embryo toxin, a more centrally displaced, thickened Schwabi's line. And there you see it. And then here's, here's that posterior embryo toxin. But now you're starting to see some thing in the iris, and you're starting to see some kind of strands across the pupil. Taylor, what is this one? Um, so this is the iris strands that are adherent to Schwabi's line. Uh -huh. What entity is this now in the step ladder? Um, is this still Axel? Oh, is this yeah. Axenfeld Reapers? Axenfeld Reapers. They used to call them separate, but now we know they're kind of the same. So they used to say, well, Axenfeld means little strands kind of from posterior embryo toxin across the angles, and Reapers, you get a little more iris atrophy, but they put this together and they call it Axenfeld Reapers anomaly. Basically, you get fibers coming across from that posterior embryo toxin from the cornea down across the angle. You also get thinning of the iris. And it's an anomaly if there's no systemic stuff. If the kid's got funny looking teeth and funny bones, then it becomes a syndrome. And so Axenfeld Reavers is the next step along in the step ladder classification. And then finally, Peters? Peters anomaly. What is Peters anomaly characterized by? Exactly. So you start to see all those other things, plus you get a big opaque area in the center of the cornea, and the reason for that is what? Uh, they have loss of endothelium in those areas. Yeah, not only loss of endothelium, but loss of, of decimase in that area. So you get this central gap in, in decimase and endothelium that then leads to central edema. And when you look, you'll see these strands coming down to the iris, the angle narrowing, these little strands of the asher, and then you get this central defect. And sometimes they'll have a focal anterior subcapsular cataract underneath it. So again, in my simplistic thinking, it's like that lens went up and took a bite out of the posterior cornea and then kept it when it went back. So you'll see this defect in the posterior cornea, and then you can even see a focal anterior subcapsular cataract. So posterior amyloid toxin, Axenfeld Riegers, Peters, and it's a stepladder. There's a classic paper that said George Warren wrote in the mid-70s. Sadly, he just passed away last year. Young, well, young, he was like, I don't know, 70s, but really healthy. He, you know, comes out here and goes skiing every year, although two years ago he came to the Moran Christmas party after he'd been stented for his heart, so his heart gave way, sadly, last year. And, but he named this, and so look that up. It's a classic article, Waring. It's the stepladder classification. And we still use it. And here you can see there's that central cornea. There's that bite taken out of it. No decimase, no endothelial cells. And that was Bartholomew's.